Good morning, everyone. Um, so, firstly, thank you for everyone coming out. I'm sure there's a few hangovers in the audience. Um, me and Carl are going to talk about uh, all the new features we've added to the Unity Particle system over the past few versions. And let's get started. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is something we added, I think it was in 5.3, so a few versions ago, um, but it was part of us focusing on adding as many of the most requested and core features to the particle system that, that lots of users are asking for. Um, we'll cover a few more further along in the talk, but two that I want to call out now was um, the 3D size and 3D rotation controls. So it just allows you to um, pick the size and the rotation per axis instead of having been constrained to just picking one size or rotation value and that being applied to the particle on all axes. You've got um, two ways of using this. So um, if you want to set it up to have a start size or a start rotation, you use the main module. And if you want them to animate and change over the lifetime of the particles, the same options are available in the rotation and size modules. Um, you just tick the box, there's a little checkbox called separate axes, you tick that and then you've got the same options for the X, Y and the Z axes. And it's pretty useful for, so if you want to make a, like leaves falling from a tree, then the 3D rotation is really useful, for example, um, to make the particles spin around. And for the size, it could be really useful for when you're wanting to use non-square textures. It was possible in the past to, uh, to kind of add padding to your textures to kind of achieve the same thing, but obviously this is more efficient. Something else we've been working on uh, in more recent Unity versions is um, a bunch of upgrades to the shape module. Um, so firstly, I've, uh, I want to show you our new thickness parameter. So, so previously, you might be familiar with the tick box for uh, some of the shapes to allow you to do edge emission or volume emission. We've changed this to be a slider. So you can see on the effects we've got here, we're able to control this now and actually uh, not just emit from the edge or the area, but actually choose somewhere in between so we can create a nice ring of particles on this circle. And you can use this on cones and spheres um, and on the, the line shape as well. We've also got a new option to allow you to choose to only emit particles at specific angles around the circular shapes. And see this in action here. So you could just, again, choose a different value to, to have particles only emitting at certain increments or certain angles around the shape. Something else we've added uh, in, I think this one's coming in 2017.1, is we've, um, we've added an extra transform component directly inside the shape module. So this allows you to actually apply positions, scales, and rotations to the, to the shape, so the source positions of the particles. Um, but it's completely independent from the game object transform, so you can, you can set this up separately, and it's not affected by whatever transforms you want to apply on your game object. 5.6 uh, added a sequencer, so a, non, a way to do non-randomized emission. So we can see here now, instead of just every particle choosing a random position around the edge of the circle, it's now sequenced. So over time, the particles choose um, an angle. And we've got a few modes for that. So we've got like a ping pong mode. So this is looping. The ping pong mode's the same, except after every cycle, it changes direction. And we've got a new align to direction option. So this one allows particles to choose uh, to face the direction that the, um, based on the shape that they're using. And this applies to all the different shapes. So it's, it's, it's particularly cool on like, mesh emitters and things as well, where the particles will face along the normals of the mesh. And then we've got a few options for uh, changing, so for, for modifying the uh, particle positions and directions after, they, after they've been spawned. Um, and again, these work with all the different shapes. So we're still spawning around the edge of the circle now, but we're, we're applying just a totally random offset to each particle, and you get to choose how much to add. And the same applies to directions. So if we give these particles a start speed, and then we've got this slider here that will actually, instead of them emitting outwards from the circle, we can ramp the slider up, and now they're emitting in, in all kinds of random directions. And it's exactly the same for sphere eyes, except so um, except instead of choosing a random direction, it becomes spherical. So I've changed it now to a box emitter. So they're all tra um, traveling kind of down and to the right um, using the box by default. If we crank up this slider, they're still starting their um, life inside the box, but then they're emitting out in a spherical direction instead. We've also added um, a new emission shape, um, which is a donut or a torus. Um, you can see that one. 
there. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and something that's cool, of course, you can use all these options together in different combinations. So it's quite, it's quite nice to, uh, to try and combine some of them, like the sequencer on the donut. And finally, we have got the skinned mesh renderer support. So you can spawn particles on the surface of a mesh. And we've got a few options for inheriting the material colors um, and things like that, and for applying offsets from the normals. Um, so yeah, this is a really useful feature. And um, we've also added blend shape support to this. So if you've got morph targets applied to your mesh, then they'll get picked up as well by the particle system. OK. So in the emissions module, uh, previously, you were limited to either using a, a rate over distance emission or a distance over time. Uh, we've now allowed you to use both. At the, you can use them both at the same time. You don't have to just pick one or the other. And they can also use them in max curve system that we use quite regularly throughout the system. We also increased the maximum number of bursts from four to eight. And uh, particularly interesting, we've added this thing called cycles and interval. So during the lifetime of the system, you can say a burst will occur so many times with a certain interval. And that allows you to create some interesting effects. So this, this effect here is what you're seeing being played out. So you've got eight cycles quite quickly, and then you get the slower ones. So that creates some nice, interesting effects. And oh, also, the distance-based emission will also work in local space now. It isn't just a world space only feature. We do now record the velocity information, so we can do that. And some little things we've added that you might miss that are good for adding some variety. We've got a ro randomized rotation direction in the house. That's just a value between 0 and 1. Uh, it's basically just uh, the chance of it going the other direction. So if you, uh, this one on the left. We set it to 0 0.5, so it'll go a different way, so you can add a nice bit of variety. And we've also got an option called Flip UVs in the texture module. So if you use that, your textures will just be flipped. <laughs> and in the collision system, we've added quite a bit of new features. We now fully support all the 2D colliders. So you can use the edges, uh, the polygon one, or the standard box and sphere. And the collisions are now aware of the size. So previously, we would only take the point and a, a sphere radius and apply that to all of them, no matter what size they currently were. We now take into account individual particle sizes, so you get much better collisions. You don't see them sinking into the collider. And coming in 2017.1, you can now have the particles apply a force. So when they collide, they will, you can tell them to apply a force to the object, push them. So as you can see here, We've got the particles keeping this ball up in the air, and that's all no script. It's just being done from the system. Uh, OK. Yeah. Uh, I want to tell you now about one of, the, um, one of the really cool features we've got coming in 2017.1, which is that we've um, integrated sprite support into the particle system. So um, basically, in a nutshell, this allows you to use all the awesome sprite tools that we've got inside Unity and use them now with particle systems. This allows some really cool stuff, such as um, setting up sprites where each individual frame of the sprite has got its own size, got its own pivot point. And of course, you get to use all the custom packing tools or the sprite packer that ships inside Unity. Um, we can see an example here. We've got uh, this explosion effect, and, and the size and the pivot point changes on each frame, so we can get the best, um, so we get the least amount of overdraw um, for the particle effect. There are a few limitations, though. Um, so all the frames that you use in your particle system, they have to share one atlas. So you have to pack all your textures into one atlas. So it's really important that the particle system is only in one draw call, um, and that's why we do this. Uh, custom polygons are ignored. So currently, all the, particle, um, uh, all the particle billboards are quads. So they use the same shape. We don't support um, kind of custom fitted shapes yet. Um, and also no sprite borders, which um, is the nine slice sprite feature. Um, so we don't support that yet in particles. But it opens up a whole um, wide range of, uh, of possibilities. And one of those I want to talk about in a tiny bit more detail is dynamic batching. So it's really efficient for particle systems to use dynamic batching. So, so when you're trying to dynamic batch things like meshes, it, we have to copy the mesh data into um, a shared buffer. But with particle systems, because it's dynamic geometry, we have to build that data anyway. So we can just build it straight into the shared vertex buffer so we avoid that extra copy that, that mesh batching has to do. Um, sprite support allows really efficient draw call batching because you can now pack 
multiple textures into a single sprite atlas. And even if each particle system is just using a single frame from that sprite atlas, you can set them all up to use the same material and use the frame over time option in the texture module for each system to just say, just use this one particular frame. And then they'll all batch together really nicely. Of course, you can also do this with the non-sprite mode, so the, the old um, texture module settings. But this is more limited, because each frame has to be the same size, because they appear on like a regular grid um, where each one's the same size and shape. OK, next, the submitter module. So we upgraded this in 5.5. And the, uh, the main things we've done here is uh, we've allowed you to transfer properties from the main emitter to the sub-emitter particles. So we see this little effect we've got on the screen here. We're able to transfer the color over to the particles. So now the green ones spawn green emitter uh, particles, and the blue particles spawn blue sub-emitter particles. We can also transfer the size. So the larger particles create larger sub-emitter particles, and again, smaller create smaller. And the same for rotation, so they're in, they inherit a rotation. And you can use these in any combination, of course. We've also um, improved. It was mainly a UI problem. We've, we've changed how we do the UI for sub-emitters, so you're no longer limited to two of each, You know, the birth, death, and collision types. You now just get an unlimited list where you can add as many as you want of whatever type. But so, so the only thing to bear in mind there is the performance, because it's easy to let things get a bit out of control with lots of sub-emitters. OK, now I want to talk about some of the rendering improvements we've made. Um, so something we added, I think this is probably 5.4. This is quite a few versions ago now, is custom pivot. So, so you guys were able to work around this by just maybe having a lot of blank space in your texture um, to make particles appear like they were spinning around a different center point. Now we've got an option. Uh, to, let you, to let you move the pivot. And you can see it in the scene view. You can visualize the pivot and place it exactly where you want. We've got a bunch of new uh, render alignment modes. So in old versions of Unity, particle billboards would always face the camera plane. And now we've got um, a bunch of different options to make them face in various different directions. So view space is the old one that you're all familiar with. We've got world space, where the particle is going to face based on the uh, world axis. Um, and you can apply your own rotations on top of this. So if you go into this, the main module and you set the start rotation, it will offset based um, on the world axes. So you can have them facing any direction, but they'll be locked to the world. So if the particle system rotates, the particles won't be affected by that. The particle rotation won't be affected by that. We've got local. This is where they do use the transform of the particle system. So when you rotate the game object, the particles will, will rotate along with that game object transform. And again, you can apply start rotation or rotation over lifetime to, uh, to apply offsets to these. Uh, next one we've got is facing. So facing is very similar to view space. But um, I've done a little diagram here to try and demonstrate it, because it's hard to see from the effect on screen. When particles face the view plane, they're all, uh, they're all parallel to the view plane. But facing actually makes them face the eye position. Um, and this is particularly noticeable when particles get very close to the screen. Um, and different effects work best using each of the different modes. Um, I think particularly in virtual reality, facing is often the right choice um, when you want them to be facing the eye. And you don't, it's easier to see the, 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 fake, uh, the fake effect that is billboarding if you're using view space particles, whereas facing um, does a better job of kind of hiding the trick. And then a final mode we've just added is velocity mode. So um, it's very similar to the stretch mode that we've uh, had in Unity for a long time. But this one, um, it doesn't stretch is the key difference. And again, you can apply your own rotations on top of it. So particles will face the direction they're traveling. But there's no stretching. And you can apply your own rotations. We've also added scaling to the particle system. So it's possible to choose from three different scaling options. We've got local, which we're in now, um, where the scale from the game object transform will be applied to the particles. So if you, if you use two times scale in your, in your game object, the particles will become two times bigger. But it will ignore all the parent scale. And that's what hierarchy is for. So in this effect, I've got, it, uh, got this effect parented to um, a game object with small scale. So when I switch to hierarchy, it means the particle system got smaller, because it's now multiplying in a small scale from the parent object. And the final option is shape, 
which is a little bit of a peculiar one. So it means that the scale is only applied to the spawning positions of the particles. So the particles have gone back to their original size. But if you notice now where they're spawning from has shrunk, the line along which we're spawning them has got really small. If you go back to local, you see the difference. Now they're spawning from a longer line, but the particles themselves are the same size. And it's worth noting that we only really officially support uniform scale. Um, and the reason for this is that things get a bit tricky with non-uniform scale. Because if you imagine you've got a view space billboard, and you scale it along the x-axis, are you expecting the particle to get wider in, in view space? Or are you expecting it to scale along whatever the x-axis of the game object transform is, which might be rotated differently? So it gets really tricky to, to figure out how to how you'd expect that object to scale. And it can look really weird when you're, you're rotating the camera around an effect like that. So we'd recommend only, only using uniform scale at this point. OK, next, I want to move on to one of the cool features in 5.5, which is the noise module. Hopefully, a lot of you have uh, been using that. And it just allows you to, use, uh, to add turbulence to your, to your particle movement. It's based on curl noise, which itself is, is based on Perlin noise. Um, and it involves combining um, a bunch of Perlin noise uh, texture fields um, on each different axis. Um, and the results give you kind of particles moving in a, in a curvy, wavy motion. So because it's based on Perlin noise, a lot of the parameters are the same. That you, if, you, if you're familiar with Perlin noise, same kind of uh, parameters apply. So we've got a strength value, which simply um, affects how fast and how far the particles will move through the noise field. So we can crank that up, and the particles are moving pretty quickly now. Um, we've got the frequency. So the frequency is how rapidly the particles will change direction. So if I increase that, now the particles aren't moving so smoothly. Um, they're much more erratic. And then the next option, if I just if I bring this down, is the octaves. So. What the octaves are, are they layers of noise. So it can get very expensive to use these in real time. So I, I recommend using them with caution. Um, but what it does is it's combining multiple layers of Perlin noise at different sizes. So you'll get, um, I guess, less predictable noise is the, is the best way of describing it. It's the kind of thing that's really best to kind of have an experiment with it and kind of get an idea for the feel, the different look it gives to your particles. But as I say, just beware. If you're using, say, four octaves, it's effectively running the noise algorithm four times. So the, the cost of the effect becomes quite expensive. And we've got a couple of other options that are worth mentioning, which aren't particularly um, connected to Perlin noise. We've just added, uh, added them to our implementation. So if I just change the settings a little bit there. So we can see now that around the circle, the particles are always picking the same path. Um, so the particles on the right-hand side of this circle, you can see them kind of moving out to the right-hand side. And they're all kind of following the same shapes, depending on where they, where they start on the circle. But we're able to actually scroll the noise field across the particle system. So even though the particle system isn't moving in the world, we can move the noise field. So now. You can see we've got um, a different, different behavior over time, so particles aren't always now following the same path. And the final one is we've got this quality setting. So as I was saying, we, uh, we compute Perlin noise for each axis, and we combine it to create um, ver um, very uh, unique curl noise for our final noise movement. If we reduce the quality settings, we get a much cheaper effect. And all we're doing to achieve that is we're not recalculating different noise values for each axis. We're actually reusing some of the same data that we calculated, say, for the x-axis. We'll use that maybe for the z-axis as well. So you'll get, um, you'll get more repetitive noise, but it's much more efficient. So if, if you're happy with the look of your effects using low or medium quality, I'd, you know, I'd recommend using it. You can save quite a bit of performance with that. So in 2017.1, we've made this system even more flexible. So as you can see in the previous slide, we were just moving the, uh, the particles around using noise. We've now got these three new sliders. Um, so this, the, this is what you've already seen. We can affect the positions. But we can also apply the noise to the rotations and the sizes. And you can use these in different quantities altogether. So we can combine the, uh, combine the effects. 
We've also added new custom vertex streams, which I'm going to cover in more detail later. Um, but basically, it allows you to send this noise data to your shaders. And that's really cool for doing things like maybe you want to move the UVs using the noise field. So you could do like scrolling UVs, but, but in a noisy, noisy pattern. And the final feature we added to the noise module is, uh, is a remapping feature. It's a bit of an advanced feature, um, but it, it offers a few interesting new use cases. So it actually lets you change the final noise value. So Perlin Noise has a, a, a fairly familiar look, which you can see on the little preview texture we've got on the bottom of this slide. By remapping the noise, we can actually change the shape of the noise. A couple of interesting use cases are to cancel out the noise in a certain range. So this circle I've got now, um, I'm using the bottom curve on the slide to uh, remove the noise from certain parts of the noise field. So now some of the parts of the circle aren't moving. They're not affected by the noise because it's canceled out. But some parts of the circle are receiving the noise. And the other easy remapping uh, thing to do is just create really erratic noise by creating a crazy zigzag curve, um, which can give you very kind of unpredictable results. But if that's the kind of effect you're looking for, it can be really useful. OK, another 5.5 feature is the Trails module. So I've created a little effect to show you some of the features here. So I've created some particles moving out from a circle, and then their game objects rotating. I'm going to show you how we can create different, uh, different effects using the trail module. So firstly, we've got a new render mode in the renderer module that allows you to turn off the particle rendering. So we can only render the trails. Useful for a bunch of, uh, bunch of situations. Uh, but that one's not in the trails module. You have to go into the render, renderer module to see that. If you don't want trails on all your particles, you can, um, you can just apply them to a small percentage by uh, dragging the ratio down. And the reason I made this effect spin is so that I can show you the world space option. So at the moment, after the trails are created and each particle leaves that trail behind, the game object rotates and it brings the trails round. It rotates them with them because they're in local space. If we press the world space option, the particles are now left behind in world space. So we get this swirling effect, whereas the game object rotates, the trails aren't following it. We've also got an option uh, to choose whether the trail will vanish when the particle vanishes. So you can see this effect looks a bit, um, it's flickering a bit. And it's because when the particles reach the end of the spiral, they vanish and the trail vanishes immediately. If we don't want that to happen, we get a much smoother effect. So now when the particle finishes, its trail will naturally finish and shrink to nothing over time. So you can create a bunch of different effects using those options. We've also got uh, a lights module in 5.5. And, and as with the trails module, this is the kind of thing you could have achieved with script. But by adding it natively into Unity, it's much more efficient. And we can add new options. Um, there's, there's a bunch of options to inherit um, like colors, intensities um, from the particle. You need know, to transfer that data from the particle to the trail and from the particle to the light. Um, so it makes it much more powerful. So we've got the option to add lights only to a percentage of the particles, because lights can be really expensive. I'd also, I should mention that if you're going to add quite a few lights, deferred is probably the best choice for, for the render mode here, because forward isn't very, um, isn't very good with lots of lights. Real-time lights, of course, are expensive. And we do support shadow casting for them. If you use that, it's going to get really expensive really quickly. So um, you can create a cool effect, like I've got this, um, I've got this effect of the Unity logo, and the, the particles are all casting shadows across it. But you don't want to, yeah, you don't want to be creating, uh, creating lots of shadow casting lights, otherwise performance is going to go down really quickly. Um, another cool option is we've got this random distribution. So let's say you're creating like a campfire effect. You probably only want to add lights to a small number of the, of the fire particles. And you've got two options for how to do this. Uh, the first is random distribution. So let's say you're adding uh, lights to 10% of the particles. Random distribution will mean that each particle has a 10% chance randomly of having a light attached to it. If you turn that option off, then it will change to being every 10th particle. So you'll get a more even spread of the lights. Um, so depending what kind of look you want to go for, uh, you can kind of you can create a more even spread of the lighting generated by the particle system. And I've already, already mentioned you can inherit a bunch of properties. OK. So we have the trigger module, which is quite similar to the collision module, but it gives you a bit more control over what's going to happen 
when these events occur. So for example here, we're modifying when the particles hit our collider or go into our collider, we're modifying their colors. Uh, and we provide four different events that you can hook into. So you've got your inside event. So any of these particles that are inside our collider, you'll get a call every time. We've got the outside, so all the white ones at the moment would be getting a call every time whilst they're outside of colliders. We've got the enter, so that's similar to sort of your on enter when you hit to get that collision. So if you want to do an effect that's only going to apply once when you enter and then apply when you exit, it's much more efficient to use the on enter, on exit, rather than just using inside. And uh, so by default, there is no automatic response. It's all up to you on what's going to happen. And we provide this UI. So those are those events, inside, outside, enter, exit. And you have a choice of ignore, so it'll just do nothing. You've got a callback, which is going to call a scripting, a, a function in your mono behavior scripts. Or you've also got an option to kill, so it'll just kill the particle. So for example, in that example we just saw there, you get this a function called on particle trigger. So this will get called, and you need to query to see which of those events has happened. So for example, you say get trigger particles, the event type, and then it will return any particles that that event has occurred for. So you don't have to get all of the particles, you just get the subset that is affected. Apply our effect, and then you push those particles back in using set trigger particles. So you only have to get the ones you're concerned with. You don't have to go and process all of the particles looking for those that are affected. So I'm going to talk a little bit about performance. So first, some of the stuff we've done that'll just work out the box for you, and then a little bit about what you can do to help improve your performance of your systems. So first, we added multi-threading. So previously, we were multi-threading the, the update process where we were simulating particles, but now we're doing geometry as well. So when we generate all that geometry information, the billboards and the various meshes, that's all part of our job system now. So that should give you a nice little performance increase. And internally, we've also started using a, a SIMD math library. So in theory, that every operation Oh, every four operations is equal to one operation now as we chew through those particles. Uh, you don't quite get a 4x improvement, though, because there's other things going on. But on average, we've found it's got about two and a half times faster. It's going to vary on particle systems. But if you've got very large systems with lots of particles, we can chew through those particles a lot quicker now. We've also um, another thing worth mentioning is what we call efficient transform updates. So, if you have a very deep nested particle system, when we, we need to query the position. And to do that, we have to go all the way up the transform and calculate the position of our system. And that can be quite inefficient. And we have to do that every frame. So now we are much more improved. We are aware the system has moved. So if you've got a static system that doesn't move, we won't have to do that every frame. It'll just happen once. And then we can cache that sort of information. So if you have, have got lots of static systems, you should see some improvements there. Oh. And now, internally in Unity, we have a performance suite. So we can run tests and start to get sort of graph data. And we've been writing a lot of performance tests for the particle system. Let me get this up. Uh, so we're going to give you some of the information on what sort of modules are slower, what are fast. So. It's not going to be quite uniform, because some modules are always being used. Some are only used when you perform an emission, such as a shape module. And some of our performance tests may need a little bit of a rethink. Because for example, our collision test, our performance test involves emitting a large amount of particles and then killing them when they hit the collider. So that's a bit misleading, because that actually improves the performance, because you're getting rid of particles. So I wouldn't trust that value. <laughs> it is a bit slower. But other ones, like for example, the lights module is very slow. And the trails module is quite slow as well. But you can see these sort of modules are all around about the same. And uh, when you see in the orange, it's basically the min-max, so the, the best performance you're going to get from it, and then the worst, so certain settings are slower. So for example, the custom data module we've got, you've got a choice of a vector or a color. And colors are much slower to process than vectors. So let's have a look at the shape module a little bit. So. We've done some improvements to uh, the mesh handling. Largely, most of, the, um, most of them are quite similar. As you can see, we've got the box shell. It's a little bit more to calculate the shell of a box than just to have the interior. And the edges is about the same. And the donut is also quite similar, so that's not too bad. And I'm, for some reason, I miss spheres. Spheres are quite fast. <laughs> and hemisphere. 
But when we go to vert meshes, that things become a bit slower. So vertexes aren't too bad. Um, we recently improved that. This is from our improvements. This used to be much slower. We, um, we used to walk through the mesh and look through the edges, look for the triangles when we needed them. We now have like a, a lookup table where we cache that information. And with that, we then get this sort of performance. So you can imagine it's, it's even slower with the, uh, without those performance improvements. And uh, a lot of our properties use these min-max curves. You've probably seen them. And there is a cost to using certain properties, some that you might not be aware about. So you've got what we call the scalar. So that is just if you're setting it as a static value, just to set like a single value, that's fine. And then we've got the two scalars, which is your random between two constants. But when we go into the curves, we've actually got two types of curves that are going on underneath. We have what we call polynomial curves, which are these two very fast ones. But if you uh, set up your curve with in a way that doesn't support our polynomial system, you have much slower performance, because we just have to evaluate them using the uh, normal curve evaluation function. And you can actually tell if that's happening with uh, this little option. It's been there for quite some time, but not a lot of people know it exists. But if you see this little cross, let me zoom in. See this little cross down here? That means it's using the slow curves. So what you can actually do is click that, and it will try and create an optimized version of your curve. And uh, if you hover your mouse over it, you'll get a little tooltip telling you what actually breaks the polynomial support. So you have more than three keys, or if your keys aren't starting at the beginning and end. So you can often just click that, and it'll give you the same curve, but it's now going to support our fast system. And we've also got the min-max gradient, which is kind of similar. We don't have any, um, any sort of polynomial stuff under the hood. Uh, but you can see that once you start to use gradients, they're much slower. And we recently added a feature what we call color lists. So this is your gradient view. Up here, you've got this called mode. So if you go to fix mode, we don't need to do any of that blending between keys. It's just essentially you're giving it a list of colors. And it, gives you, it also gives you a nicer, different type of effect, as you can see here, our color list. And you can see the gradient version. There's the same effect, but one is doing blending between the colors. So that's a, a little feature we've added, but it's also a little bit better for performance. And finally, uh, so we're going to talk about what we call procedural mode or automatic culling. So depending on how you're, the features that you've enabled in your system, internally we have what's called procedural mode. So that is where we can predict the state of a particle system at any point in time. And if we can do that, then that means we don't have to can constantly update it when it's not on screen, when it's cold. And so we're much more efficient. And it also means if you want to simulate for a particle system, you can kind of jump to that point in time instantly. We don't have to work, kind of wind through up to that point to figure out where things are going to be. But when you enable certain features, you lose that support, such as collisions. We're no longer able to predict the state of the system if collisions are on, because we don't know what's happening in the rest of the world. We don't know where the colliders are, if they're coming by, which means that we have to continuously update the system, even if it's not on the screen. And that can be quite costly if you've got thousands of systems and all you're doing is just a little bit of like sparks like we've got here. You can see we've just got these little sparks bouncing off. But really, we don't care if this is updated when it's off the screen. And no one's going to notice if it's being simulated or not. So what we can do is we can do some little performance improvements ourselves so we can tell the system to turn itself off or to pause it when it's not on screen. So I'm going to go for a little example and show you how to do something like that. So let's open up a simple project. So here we've got a, uh, some programmer art. <laughs> Just, uh, lots of these fires everywhere. Now we pull up the profiler. And I can find it. Turn off, maximize. Let's press play. And we care about this one, so I'm just going to filter this. OK, so we can see, thinking about 1.5 milliseconds for all these particle systems that are off the screen at the moment. So let's have a look at this system. For some reason, my camera's on angle. <laughs> 
So really, we could, if we could add some culling, our own culling, and just turn the thing on and off when it's not on the screen. So we added a feature called, let's click on our system. First, I'll show you. So when I was talking about procedural and culling mode, you can actually tell if it's being culled or not by this little icon up here. You can see this little speech bubble. And if you hover your mouse over it, you get a tooltip. And it tells you why it's not using the procedural mode. So it's because we're using the rotation by speed module here. And if we go and turn rotation by speed module off, it's now using it, so that warning's gone. And there's lots of different warnings. It's like, for example, sometimes using 3D size instead of just two, the single size will cause that. And it will tell you this axis is causing us to break procedural mode. And once procedural mode's broken, it can't be re-enabled whilst the system is running. You have to stop it and start it. So it's not, you can't really turn these properties on and off, and it won't just resume it. So let's have a look at how we might do some custom culling. So we've got a little script I've created. I'm going to edit this. So we've got this class called culling group, and that was added quite recently. And that allows you to hook into Unity's culling system. So that will work with the normal frustrum culling. I hope I said that right. And also the occlusion culling. And you can get notifications about when these systems come on and off when they're cold. And then you can use that to maybe improve the performance of a script, turn things on and off. You can do what you want, really. So for us, we're going to pause our particle system when it's cold. And then we're going to resume it when it comes back on screen. So let me just make this bigger. So you see here, we're just setting up the culling system, just creating a new culling group, giving it a target camera. So it has to know which camera it's performing the culling from. And then you give it a set of bounding spheres. So for us, we're just doing a single one. But if you had a particle system that maybe wasn't going to fit in a sphere, you kind of had an interesting shape. You could block it out with multiple spheres. It doesn't just have to be a single sphere. And then we have this event here called on state change. So when it goes in and out of culling, we'll get a notification. So as you can see here, we get this event. And all we do is go, we have a, multiple, we have a list of particle systems. We're not just doing one. And we're going to go through and just play them or pause them, depending on if we go in the, the camera or out the camera. And finally, we just do some cleaning up. And we've also got gizmos, so we can actually visualize the radius, so we can set it up. So let's go back to Unity and enable our scripts. And you can see that's our little gizmo. So that's going to represent our culling radius. And these are the systems. So we've been through these. And I've added all the ones that are not using automatic culling. So I haven't added the ones that are procedural, such as that one, because they're going to do it automatic, so we don't care about them. So let's enable that. We'll apply that. Let's have a look at that performance again. So if we look at the old data just quickly. You can see that it was averaging about 1.5. We can see that. Let me zoom in. So let's zoom out. So we're going to play it again and see how it's looking. So it's, uh, that's OK. I was hoping for better. <laughs> when I was practicing, I was going down to a 0.8, but it's still better. It's now we're averaging about 1. But all we've done is just enable culling. And the system looks the same. And so it's a nice little trick you can use if you've got a lot of particle effects. It might be worth going to check and just see, are they using automatic culling or not? And if they are, are they systems that can benefit from this? Not every system is going to work. If you need it to be updating when it's off screen, then it's, you just have to have it updating. But if you can just turn the thing off when it's not on screen, it's worth doing. So let's go back. I don't care about that. So one last thing worth mentioning is animation support. So I think it was about 5.3. We noticed that only part of the system supported animation. There was certain bits that were losing the support. So we just went through and we added animation support for everything. So you can actually animate all of the particle properties. When it comes to the min-max curves, you can only animate the actual scalar value. You can't animate keys or anything like that. But with that, it's quite good. If you've got a script and you're currently going through the particles and you maybe want to change the color, if you can do that with an animation instead, you will get better performance because it's hooked in, and you won't have to do that, copying the particles to your script, doing the work, then passing them back. 
the particle system will just work underneath, uh, the animation system even. So you can just get performance benefits just from using an animation instead of using a script. Well, that's certainly worth trying. And uh, Richard. <laughs> All right, there's one last, uh, one last big feature I wanted to talk to you about uh, that we added in 5.5, and we made it even better in 5.6, and that is custom vertex streams. So it's a fairly advanced feature, and it allows you to pass all the particle data into your shaders. Usually, your shader would only know about uh, the position, the color, the texture coordinate data it would need, and the normal use for lighting. But now we're able to actually pass particle-specific properties into our shaders, uh, such as the rotations, the velocity, how long the particle's been alive. Um, and that allows you to do all kinds of new custom effects in, uh, directly in your shaders. Um, we've also added a custom data module. And that lets you feed custom data into this uh, system as well. So if you don't want to use built-in particle data, such as the lifetimes, you could define your own curves and your own color gradients and pass those in and use those for whatever you want as well. Um, so we're going to make a simple example to show you how it works. And um, we're going to make this effect that you can see on the screen here, which is um, it's like burning bits of paper. So it's a common technique uh, often referred to as alpha erosion. So we're, um, we're eroding the edges of the alpha on the texture um, to, to fade out the particles. So rather than using transparency, we're, uh, we're actually kind of dissolving the edges of the page. There's no real built-in support for this in the particle system, um, and, but we can add it really easily with, um, with custom vertex streams. Also, it's important to, that we want to control it with a curve so that the final result's artist-friendly. Um, we've got a texture here which defines how the dissolve happens, but we want, um, we want to back it up with a curve so that an artist can control the speed. So, so you can see here it's starting really slowly, and then once it gets going, it speeds up. And we're controlling that with a curve. So we'll, we'll look at setting that up as well. So we'll start with the UI. So we'll look at the custom data module. And first, um, that's exactly where we're going to set up our curve. So you see on screen, we've set it up. Um, we've got that vector mode and gradient mode. Vector just means um, four floats in, in our case. And um, each of those floats can be a curve, or it can be a single value. So we've decided we only want one. That's the x value. And we've set up this curve, which starts slowly and then speeds up to the end. It's worth mentioning as well, in 2017.2, we've made the, the label where you can see the x uh, just down there. We've made that editable. So you can click on that, and, uh, and you'll be able to type in your own little bit of information to just tell you what you're using that curve for. So if you imagine you've got three or four different curves set up, and they're just called x, y, z, or whatever, you likely you're going to forget which is which and what they're used for in the shader. So you're able to give them labels in 2017 too, and that'll just help you give them good names so you know what they're used for in the shader. So now we've got our UI. We need to pass it into the shader. So we do that using the renderer module. And there's an option. There's a little, little checkbox called custom vertex streams. It's off by default, and it just means you get the basic shader functionality. If we tick that box, we get to choose what we're sending into the shaders. When you tick it, you'll see the, the defaults will appear, so position, normal, color, and the texture coordinates. And you can see the one I've highlighted is our new, uh, our new option. So when you press the little plus in the bottom right of the UI, you get a list of all the possible vertex streams you can add. And we're just adding the custom 1.x, which, which relates back to, if I just go back a slide, that relates back to the, uh, the, the x curve that we've set up here. So now we've got it going into the shader, but we haven't actually written our shader yet. So that's the next step. We've got two options for writing a shader. You can write it by hand, um, which is what we're going to do. Um, but if you're, if you're not a programmer or you, you have access to, say, ShaderForge or Amplify, something like that, like a visual shader authoring tool, you can use that as well. But we're going to go through it and I'm um, just going to show you a little bit of code for, for how we'd write a shader for this. So we're going to use a surface shader. And the first, um, the first bit to look at is the input data that we need to put into the shader, so the app data. So the UI in the renderer module gives us a, um, gives us a little clue as to gives us the information as to how to map, how to write this input structure. So in the brackets next to each stream, it tells you how to write, how to write that input structure. So we've got the position, the normal, the color, the texture coordinates. 
and then this final entry is our new one, and it's telling us text chord 1.x. And that's telling us it's the second texture coordinate stream. So text chord 0 is the first one. And the dot x means it's just the, the first component. So there's four components in the texture coordinate, x, y, z, and w. And it's just saying it's just the x value. So we can write that in our shader structure as just a single float. The next step is to actually use that in our surface shader. So we're going to read the texture like normal. And we're going to set the, the diffuse color. But then we want to do this alpha erosion effect. And to do that, we're going to use an alpha test in the, in the shader. And that's the clip function. And all we're doing to achieve that is we're taking the texture alpha, which was the texture I showed you before that controls the erosion, the dissolve effect. And we're subtracting our curve value for it. And each particle is going to be feeding in a different value based on its life and where it is along that curve. And the clip function works by just getting rid of any pixels um, when you pass a value less than 0 into it. So when we subtract the, the curve from the alpha, any pixels that have been dissolved already will get discarded. So you'll notice that I've, um, I've missed out the glowing edges. So we'll cover that now. We can add a second piece of custom data to achieve that. So we'll go back to our UI. We'll add um, a HDR color to the custom 2 section. Um, and you'll notice, yeah, this, this, this gradient supports HDR colors, which we don't support elsewhere in Unity. Um, I guess mainly for legacy and platform reasons. Um, we, we store the colors as bytes, so they can only be LDR. But in the new custom data module, all the data is floats. It's full floating point, which means we can, um, we, we can define HDR colors. And we've updated the gradient editor to let you, um, let you declare these. But we just need a single color in this case. So we're not going to be using the HDR gradient editor, just the HDR color picker. And you'll see underneath, I've also shown you the renderer module. We'll need to add a second stream, a second custom stream. And that's custom2.xyz. And we'll see it's actually sharing the, uh, the text chord 1, but it's using, the, uh, it's using the final three components of the same texture coordinate. So it's packed it together into a single texture coordinate, which is more efficient. So we need to add that to the, to the, the input structure. So you see, we, we used to have a float for our custom data, because we only had one value. We've now got the dissolve value in the x coordinate, and we've got the HDR color in the final three components. So we need a float for. So, so it's, it's as simple as just changing the float to be a float for there. And then in the surface shader, uh, surface shaders support uh, an emission value. Um, so all we do is we set, the, uh, we set the HDR color to the emission value. But we only want it to happen around the edges of the texture where the dissolve is happening. So we've declared a material parameter called burn tolerance. And all that's doing is, is controlling how thick the burn effect is going to be. And then we've got a little bit of maths there to, um, to lerp between no glowing and full glowing based on where the burn effect currently is. And that's the final effect. So that's how you'd achieve alpha erosion. And we've got a secondary color as well in that shader. OK, so I'm going to finish up now uh, just by talking very quickly about our roadmap. So we've got a few things coming in the future. Um, the big one we're working on is the standard particle shader. So we're hoping to give you guys kind of the equivalent of the standard shader, but for particles. So it'll give you physically-based rendering, um, but it'll also give you, it gets rid of some like light mapping features and things that we don't need for particles, um, and introduce instead specific uh, controls to make it easy for you guys to set up some of the particle features, such as like blended flipbooks, for example. We support that in Unity, but it, uh, without, um, without us providing a good shader, you end up kind of using custom vertex streams and writing your own shaders to achieve it. So we want to just give you like a simple GUI where you can just say, yes, I want blended flipbooks, and it'll do the extra texture read and blend the frames together for you. Um, it also gives you a nice UI for uh, controlling soft particle fade distances, for doing refraction effects, things that are specific to particles, but all, all encompassed in a simple UI. We've also just shipped Linear Dragon to 2017.2. 
So it's the same um, idea as is used in the physics system. So uh, we can make, we can apply drag uh, to, to big particles and to fast particles, but apply less drag to small and slow particles. So this is really cool for debris, like if, for explosion effects. So you want the small particles to kind of shoot out of the effects, but the big heavy bits of debris, they don't, they don't shoot out so much. And you can, uh, you can use the linear drag to achieve that. And that's going to be in the limit velocity module. We're also working on uh, a big upgrade to the external forces module. So I'm sure you've seen that's pretty simple at the moment. And it's, it's, it's not very usable because in, well, in, in a lot of situations because it's global. If you set up a wind zone, it's going to affect any particle system that's got that module enabled. Um, so there's no way to just apply certain wind zones to certain particle systems. And also, wind zones, you can only do a limited amount with them. So we're adding new types to do vortex effects, uh, gravity, drag just within a field, uh, things like that. Um, so that's part of a big upgrade. Uh, we're also working on ribbonized trails. So it's just a new option in the trails module. Uh, so instead of each particle leaving a trail behind it as it moves, we're just going to have um, an option to create a trail which just connects all the particles in one, in one ribbon. Uh, and I think, Carl, you want to talk <laughs> about the UI. So uh, first, the same caveat as yesterday applies about roadmaps. They're, they're not promises. They are things we would like to do. <laughs> so um, we know a lot of people want to use particles in UI, and there are some solutions people are kind of hacked together. Um, and we have talked to the UI team. <laughs> and we have a plan to get them working together. So hopefully, we will get particles and UI working nicely together in the future. That's our, that's our current plan. <laughs> um, one thing we are doing is like kind of the rest of the Unity teams is we're, we're trying to get features out to you as soon as we can. So that's what we've got, these experimental features section. So for example, you can grab the standard shader, mm -hmm. you're saying. And they're all, there's a link here. So hopefully, once we do start to get things like the UI system working, and that we will put them out early as possible to get people's feedback. Great. All uh, right. I think that's it, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> so that's the end of our talk. Thank you very much.